You know how you buy a computer in January and by February there's a smaller, faster, less expensive one out there? Sure, things move fast, but according to my next guest, you ain't seen nothing yet. Joining us via satellite from Boston, say welcome to author, inventor, and futurist Raymond Kurzweil. Hey, thanks for being on the screen, Save. <clears throat> Glad to be here. Now, in your book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, you make many startling, really mind-blowing predictions about the future of the machine and the effect that that future will have on humanity. But before we talk about that future, we really have to understand how the past has caused you to formulate your predictions. And maybe the best way to do that is within the framework of the notion of exponential growth. What is exponential growth? Well, this stems from my interest in being an inventor because I wanted to see where technology was headed. And I began to develop uh, mathematical models of, of uh, how technology evolves. And exponential growth in the power of computers is well known. We call it Moore's Law. But it turns out that Moore's Law is really just one of the paradigms. It's really the fifth one. We've been growing computers exponentially for 100 years. And the same exponential growth, actually double exponential growth, occurs in many other fields. Communications, our understanding of the brain, uh, genomic science, we're miniaturizing technology at an exponential rate. Uh, many different aspects of technology are expanding their powers exponentially. So essentially what it means is progression just keeps getting faster and faster and faster as technology gets more powerful. Right, but it's not linear. It, it means that we're essentially doubling the power of these technologies every so often. Now in computers, it's actually every year we're doubling the power of computation. So and that's going to continue. When one paradigm runs out of steam, like integrated circuits, we go to another paradigm. We'll replace flat integrated circuits with three-dimensional circuits. That's the next uh, method that will keep exponential growth going for computers. So let's apply exponential growth to the future. What will computers be like in, uh, say, 10 years from now, 2010 or so? Well, in 10 years, because of the miniaturization, uh, they're going to disappear. We won't be carrying around rectangular objects or even spherical objects. They'll be embedded in our clothing. Images will be written directly to our retina from our eyeglasses and contact lenses. We'll have extremely high bandwidth connection to the internet at all times. So, for example, we'll be able to enter virtual reality environments invol involving the visual and auditory sense. So you can actually feel like you're with someone and look around them uh, just by uh, actually seeing their image directly written to your retina. And you'll actually it'll actually feel like you're in that environment. Uh, displays will be replaced by virtual images that hover in air. And we'll be encountering a lot of embedded intelligence. So everyday objects of walls or clothing or eyeglasses will all be embedded with computation. And then we move up to, say, 2020, and you say that uh, for $1,000 in today's money, you could get a computer that is, has the computational power of the human brain. And when you say the computational power of the human brain, I mean, computers right now, a computer can beat Kasparov in chess, but this is, this is all well, encompassing? Com computers can beat us at narrow tasks, playing chess, uh, guiding a cruise missile, making medical diagnoses, making financial investment decisions, but they don't have yet the subtlety and suppleness of human intelligence. And there's two requirements. One is the hardware capacity and a conservatively high estimate of 20 million billion calculations per second, uh, which is at the upper end of the range of estimates will be achieved by $1,000 of computation by 2020. But that's just the hardware. The more salient issue is the software, the knowledge, and the organization of those resources. And that's going to take us longer till about 2030 before we finish actually reverse engineering, understanding the principles of operation of how the human brain works, and then re-implementing those methods in these very powerful future computers. And you say that by 2030, we're talking about computers for 1000 bucks that have a thousand times the computational power of the human brain. And people right. start to discuss the legal rights of computers. Tell me about that. Well, it's, it, there's not going to be a sharp distinction between biological, say, human, and non-biological machine computer intelligence. We're going to be p placing intelligent machines in our own brains. Now, we're doing that today with people who have disabilities, like I have a deaf friend who has a cochlear implant, interfaces directly with his neural circuits. Uh, there's a new implant for Parkinson's patients that actually replaces the cells that are destroyed by that disease. 30 years from now, it's, it's not just going to be people with severe disabilities that use uh, this technology. We'll be introducing intelligent machines through the bloodstream without surgery. They'll make their way into the brain and actually augment our biological intelligence. So if you encounter someone in 2030 or 2035, they're really a hybrid 
a biological and non-biological intelligence. Now, because bi non-biological intelligence grows exponentially over time, as we talked about before, ultimately most of the computation in, in our brains, even of a biological human, uh, will be non-biological. So it's not going to be a sharp distinction of machines on the right side of the room, humans on the left. It's going to be a whole continuum between the two. And, and if people don't start to put these implants within themselves, are they going to be able to keep up? Are they going to be able to have meaningful existences in society? Will there be a massive split, a grand neo-Luddite movement? The, uh, they'll be able to have the same meaningful experiences they have now, but there'll be a whole level of dialogue uh, that they won't be able to participate in, particularly as we go out to, say, 2040, when we're talking about machines being millions or billions of times more powerful than human intelligence. You really will need to uh, take advantage of this technology to keep up with the, the explosive expansion of human knowledge and the dialogues that will take place. You know, this all sounds like, you know, the stuff of science fiction. It would be easy to dismiss it as, as science fiction. It's crazy, but you certainly have the pedigree to back this up. The predictions that you made throughout the 80s have more or less come to pass in the 90s, and you've developed such things as Kurzweil music systems. Well, let's talk a little bit about art and music in the future, because you're, you're interested in that. You've done the music. There you are there with Stevie Wonder. You've also built the cybernetic poet. How is art? and performance going to change as these computers get more and more advanced? Well, we're already using computers as very powerful tools to help us create art. I mean, I predicted in the 80s that by the end of the century, most commercial music would be created by computers and electronic synthesizers, and that's true today. And we're already beginning to actually jam with computers and have computers generate a walking bass line or appropriate rhythmic uh, accompaniment. So we're creating music by collaborating with the intelligence of our machines. And, and there are some examples where computers can be creative. We have a cybernetic poet and artist on, on one of our websites that actually is creative. That represents the knowledge about art or poetry of humans, but these systems can be creative on their own without further assistance. Uh, when we go out to the point where really machines can encompass the full range of human intelligence, when we fully reverse engineered the brain, and we have machines that have the same suppleness and subtlety of human intelligence, they'll be artists with their own reputation in creating art and music and, and new forms of creativity, for example, designing new virtual reality environments and All so right. forth. So just, just to wrap up here, are you optimistic about this future, a future where machines are going to have greater thinking capacity than humans? Will the machines take over like in so many dystopian novels and movies? Or not. Well, if you, if you combine all these revolutions, the ones we've been talking about with computers and intelligence, nanotechnology, the ability to create any entity uh, atom by atom, uh, the, the breakthroughs that are coming in biotechnology, we'll have the means of overcoming disease, greatly extending longevity, overcoming poverty, uh, all presumably positive things. But there is a downside. Technology is a double-edged sword. It empowers both our creative and destructive sides. and this, I think what we're really afraid of is the duality of human nature, the fact that these technologies can be applied for our human goals, some of which are destructive. Uh, so we're going to have to actually build in technological immune systems, be very concerned with the, the misuse of these technologies, just as we are today. We've seen that uh, with September 11th, that technology, and those weren't the most recent technologies, can be abused. Uh, for destructive purposes. We're, we're going to have to be very mindful of that. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much for joining us here on the Screensavers, Raymond. I'm Great it. pleasure. That, my pleasure. All right, and be sure that you check out his website. It's kurzweilai.org, or .net, I'm sorry. There it is right there.